We are actually move, going to move the conversation on about trying to measure business purpose. So I think we understood this morning from Charles and Lockling and also from Sir Mike Rake that the importance of business purpose. But um, as always, one of the challenges, and I speak particularly as an investor and working in the investment management industry, how does one actually know whether a company has purpose? If you were to bump into a company, if you want to invest in a company, how do you actually know that oh, this company, in fact, has, in fact, lives out a very, very noble purpose? So that's one of the things that we want to talk about. And, and to do that since the conference last year, a group of us, which is a small project team of a variety of investment managers, and they're quite a diverse group of investment managers, and I'll introduce in a moment, we formed a little team to go about the task of actually trying to measure purpose. So trying to put all these principles that you have in your pack to say, well, how do you actually know? Because as, 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 as we all know, you know, talk is cheap and many CEOs you know, talk up their business and say what wonderful things that they're doing, but how do you actually know? Is there any way that you can actually measure this? So the panel, um, and we'll, 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 we'll introduce the panel shortly, we have Louise right at the end, Louise Dudley from Hermes, Louise and Andy in the middle there are in fact going to do the first part of this, which is about a presentation around measuring purpose. And then we have, after that we're going to discuss it, and in the panel we'll have uh, Saganus Bear, who is the CEO of Hermes, uh, James McPherson, who, is the, who runs equities in BlackRock. Very important to get BlackRock. As if you don't know BlackRock, it's not a household name. They, in fact, they own everything. They kind of own the world. So <laughs> that's, the, that's the guy you need to kind of get to know. And obviously John Kay, who doesn't need any, any um, introduction. So I'm going, to, I'm going to stop there and hand over to Andy and Louise to talk us through measuring uh, purpose. You actually have the detailed presentations in your pack. So if you don't to see the slides, you can in fact follow it in your pack. Thank you. So my name's Andy Howard. I run a research firm, Didus Research. Um, somehow, much of the task of developing a framework for measuring progress, and measuring performance on business principles fell to Hermes and Didus and to Louise and I. There's still an inquiry going on into uh, quite how we agreed to, uh, to, to such a uh, monumental task. I'm going to run through briefly the sort of preamble of how we approach the question, the sort of high-level view of the challenges that we faced, and Louise is going to go through the details of precisely what we did. Our focus at Didus is on long-term investing, helping investors find companies that outperform in the long run, which may slightly sound contradictory with the, uh, the sorts of measures that we used in our framework and the sorts of discussions that we're having here today. But actually, there's a fairly significant overlap between the work that we do, which ultimately has a purely financial focus, um, and the sorts of discussions that we're having today and the sorts of metrics that we looked at in the framework that Louise is going to describe. Ultimately, companies, in order to succeed in the long term, need a guiding purpose and a guiding principle that underpins the way they engage with society and stakeholders that ultimately results in more durable business models, better financial performance, and ultimately better stock, long-term stock, uh, stock returns. So rather than viewing the two things as a trade-off, I think it's increasingly important that we think about the two things as actually being two steps in a process. Purpose is the beginning of a process, profits is the end of that process. Without those two things being in alignment, it's difficult to see profitability being sustainable. So to the details, um, measuring purpose is challenging at best. Purpose ultimately comes down to the DNA, vision, and culture of an organization. It's the principles that guide the way people behave in their day-to-day -day decision making, the way they treat their customers, employees, other stakeholders, when the CEO, their manager, isn't looking. And many of us who have worked in organizations with strong cultures or strong purpose will recognize uh, what that means. However, putting your finger on it from the outside is rather challenging. Tracking what those principles are or what that purpose is in any uniform way is rather difficult from the outside. Mission statements, bluntly, aren't too useful. Most companies have one. Few people within organizations know precisely what they are, and they're typically too broad and too generic to be too much use. Principles and purpose ultimately need to involve trade-offs. They involve guiding an organization to make choices in a particular direction where, where there are viable alternatives. 
and the sorts of generic statements that pepper corporate reporting typically don't do this. So on closer inspection, the question of how do we sit down with a spreadsheet and actually start working through the question of measuring and tracking performance with respect to the business principles that we're discussing today isn't as straightforward as it sounds. We, within our group of... Within, within the group of investors that we put together, which, as Ben says, spans some of the largest financial organisations um, here in London, uh, we basically set about approaching things in this way. We started from the business principles um, that I'm going to touch on in a moment, which have been discussed earlier today, and then worked through a process of relating those to what metrics can we find that help us understand how effectively companies are addressing and implementing those principles how can we begin to compare companies' progress towards those principles? And then ultimately, how can we use this in an objective tool for helping companies to think about their progress along that journey? And Louise will run through the details of how we did that. I won't try and read out the text on this slide. I think you've seen the principles that we started from uh, earlier in today's discussion, and they are in the pack. Um, but in fact, what we developed really is a framework for assessing the extent to which companies take the actions that are needed to implement those principles, and then measures the extent to which they're working on doing so. It's not a perfect approach. Trying to boil the purpose of a company down to a number is clearly a slightly daft idea, even from within an organisation, and even harder from the outside. But the basic approach of bringing some structure, logic, and quantification to understanding where a company is on that journey towards implementing principles, such as are outlined on the slide, is a very logical starting point and I think sheds a great deal of light on how companies are approaching the question, how committed they are to, to doing so, and where they stand along that journey. And I'll hand over to Louise to run through the details of that roadmap and the methodology that we used. Thank you. So, um, I'm not going to go into too many details, hopefully, but um, I wanted to give you a little bit of flavour of what we've been talking about in the group and the progress that we've made on this. First of all, um, I'll talk about our approach. So you can see on the left, we had our pr the five principles of a better business down the left. And we used our expertise within the group to think about metrics that we could use to assess a company but in, in terms of alignment against these principles. These are just some of the uh, metrics that we use and what, what we actually identified is that there are many metrics out there and that individually, maybe, they don't seem to answer the question, but once grouped together, they start to separate companies into those that are better and those that are not as good. So you can see there's uh, two columns to the right, one which is how much and one which is how well. So we group the metrics that we found into these two areas, the how much metrics what they do is they look in a more objective way. They say, is the company doing this, yes or no? It's more clear cut. There are potentially numbers behind these things that there isn't any discretion uh, in terms of how aligned a company is against the principles. The second set, the how well, there's a little bit more subjectivity. Some companies are doing these things very well in that we can say that they've fully integrated um, their thought uh, within the full part of their supply chain and some not so well. So from these metrics we combine these two scores, the how much score and the how well score. The last point that I'd make at the bottom is um, when we were looking at the five different principles, the fifth principle has purpose which delivers long-term sustainable performance was quite difficult to capture. We used two proxies here, the UN Global Compact signatory, which you may be aware of as a, a, a methodology that um, companies can sign up to be aligned um, to say that they're not breaching several of these UN Global Compact principles. We also used responsible asset management, which would apply only to certain sectors, um, but we felt um, answered the question of purpose. We then took the two scores, the how much score and the how well score, and plotted them. For 
for our sample, we used the FTSE 100. You can see the results now. There doesn't appear to be much of a relationship here. But what we actually decided is that it's not so much about where you are, it's about the journey. So we started to identify the companies in various areas of this graph. Yet the companies down at the bottom that weren't disclosing very much information or demonstrating their integration on these factors. So we described those companies as starting out. Secondly, we had the companies that had started to think about how they communicate to their shareholders and their other stakeholders, how they're performing against these um, principles. Finally, we have the companies at the top right. These are the companies that have been able to demonstrate and are effectively implementing um, these policies. As I said before, it's about a journey. So we expect companies, even at the top right, would still continue to um, progress along this. I'm sure you're all uh, interested to hear which of the companies which score well on our uh, metric. I know some of the people here, obviously, within that FTSE 100 group. We thought we'd just highlight a couple of those companies um, that do fall at the top right. You may be surprised to see some of these companies here that are companies which potentially have in the past um, had problems communicating um, their alignment to what we think about on the principles. Actually, what, what we decided amongst the group following our discussion is that these are companies that face the greatest public scrutiny in terms of alignment to the principles, and therefore they have gone the extra mile in terms of demonstrating <coughs> this. And that's what our results showed on this. Following on from the process that we followed, uh, the discussions that we had, there were three main conclusions that we thought about. The methodology that we propose does separate companies along this journey. However, we should bear in mind that this is a very um, a small sample of companies and um, there are many different uh, companies out there that are doing these types of methodologies and it's very difficult currently to capture purpose within a company. Purpose is something that's very difficult to measure the culture of a company and how well they're doing is very difficult as we said to see from the outside. However the methodology that we used is objective and consistent. So the company themselves can see where they fall, and potentially where they could move towards. The methodology that we've used can be seen as a tool. It's made to be used and to be practically implemented, and hopefully to facilitate discussion. There's no right or wrong in this. The second thing that we thought about as uh, investment professionals, which again is very sum something that's subject to a lot of academic scrutiny, is is there a correlation between the alignment measure, so the how much and the how well combined together, and a sampled um, profitability measure, and we use ROE. What we actually saw is that there wasn't any significant positive or negative correlation. This is, could be seen as a, as a non-result, potentially. But the way how we viewed it within the group was not that it was no result, is that it doesn't hurt you to be good. So hopefully that's a message that um, we can think about and potentially go forward and think about actually maybe ROE isn't the best way of looking at um, how well a company is delivering performance going forward. In conclusion, evidencing a purpose-driven business is difficult and challenging. There were many different views across the panel of how you might do that and 
the metrics that we've chosen are, are certainly not the best way, um, they're just one way. The blueprint principles, however, have articulated um, for companies something that can be aspired towards <coughs> and that a commitment to the principles is a good way for a company to be able to say this is something we're working towards even if they don't fall particularly, um, score particularly well on this metric that we have at the moment. The last point is that we believe that um, the dialogue between investors and companies is important and again the principles can be used in this way to when investors are speaking to companies to uh, promote discussion on these type of issues and show that it is important. So with that, I'd like to pass back to Ben um, so we can facilitate the discussion. Thank you, Louise. And uh, we'll move Andrew back to take a seat. So we're going to have a discussion now, not just about uh, measuring purpose, but also about what are some of the barriers, what are some of the hindrances of a company to having a good purpose and what can we actually do to maybe encourage or incentivize companies to in fact have a good purpose. But let's just start with what we've seen. I'm particularly keen to ask the, the, the asset managers on the panel. I mean, as asset managers, as shareholders, how keen are you about company purpose? Uh, ben, if I can take that up for those of you who haven't read the, the pack, I'm James McPherson from BlackRock. I think the, one of the, the key obstacles, and I think John touched on it in his uh, very illuminating speech, was that there is a, 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 a queasiness, to say the least, uh, in, in the corporate sector about not putting shareholder value at the sort of front and center of everything they do. Uh, businesses like Simple Goals, and, and this is one that sort of unifies a lot of business culture. Um, and I think there is a, a, a gradual shift in the mood that, that is beginning with, with organizations such as the Blueprint to, to, to move that dialogue along. And I, I think you saw from Mike Rake's presentation that there's a lot of goodwill on the part of business leaders towards achieving that. Um, so I think that's really one of the key obstacles, that conflict or the, the apparent conflict, which I don't think there is between um, pursuing a shareholder value approach and pursuing an approach which actually <coughs> recognise the interests of, of a wider number of communities. I think from my point of view as, a, as an investor, and I'm a, an active investor, so I, say very, I take very deliberate decisions about which companies I want to own, I think there is a clear correlation between companies who really try to pursue a, a singular purpose which has a social end, uh, and where their, their company, their employees are really genuinely aligned to that. Uh, and for me, um, there's a huge amount of uh, noise and, uh, and, um, and irrelevant information in the short-term financial metrics uh, that we get bombarded with as fund managers. But actually taking a longer-term view has convinced me that we can make a lot more money for our clients, which is ultimately what our fiduciary responsibility is. Sir, do you want to comment? Because it, what, we, what we saw from Louise was that you can't actually measure purpose. My concern is... Is this, is this just a PR strap line? You know, mm. and there are lots of good strap lines, but you know, so as an asset manager, how do you actually go about doing it and, and how do you promote it? So um, let's start with the thing that she said. It does not hurt to be good. And that's quite important. Because until now, if people wanted to be not just in business, but wanted to be good, the only people who really liked them were people like Joe Carafino from The Guardian, who liked them because he's a bit left wing. Uh, and everybody else kind of thought a bit loony to be in the capitalist system. And, and that is an important point to make. The second element of it is, um, what is the purpose of investment ultimately? Uh, and it's to find long-term returns. And, and James and I are all colleagues and we both agree with this. And ultimately, fund managers are simply agents for the same people who own the system. And the people who own the system are not very rich capitalists. The people who own the system are ordinary citizens. Typically, we know from the National Statistical Office who would retire on about £10,000 a year. They own the system because they own the shares. And it is in this interest that the companies behave, as Professor Kay has so rightly said, not in a single direction of simply magnifying profits, but in a more holistic approach that strikes a balance between all stakeholders within society. And what's more, that they do it in such a way that they remain tolerated by society. Uh, if we think about the discussion we're having about the investment banking system, 
what we're saying is society no longer tolerates them as part of society and trying to regulate them. So putting that together, what it says to me is that if as an agent of long-term investors, who are the ultimate owners, I am looking for very long-term returns, then one of the things I should be looking for in companies uh, is uh, an indication that these companies that understand, again, as was intimated earlier, that companies have uh, a, a personality as a corporate citizen and therefore has obligations as well as duties. And in that sense, they're more likely to be more effective in the long term and to be sustainable in the long term if they adhere to this. And that is why this thing about purpose is important. One last trap line. Of course, it's not easy to have it in a box and to just say, this is how we do it, and you take it. Most things in life are about judgment, or most important things in life are about judgment. And judgment is not easy. And one needs a moral compass, wherever that moral compass comes from, to arrive at that judgment. Um, I'm probably the only person, uh, it's not true, but I'm, I'm one of the people who says that in this discussion, we shouldn't be too obsessed with trying to find out how we can fit purpose and goodness with actually how the free market economy works. I just take the view that we are, uh, as Kant said, moral beings. And we have to recognize that. And corporations are an extension of our whole. And they should have that as a moral compass to how they interact with society. So I'm going to pause and open up for questions as well on the presentation. The question right at the end, and also here and also here, before we want the discussion. Yes, sir, please. Hi there. Um, Graham Randalls from NEF Consulting, part of the New Economics Foundation. Uh, thanks very much for the presentation. Um, the, one of the things that troubles me a bit about it is that it seems to me that uh, <coughs> some of the indicators that you've used are a bit self-fulfilling. So by choosing those indicators, you're quite likely to get those results. Um, and it's perhaps not surprising that a lot of um, companies which wouldn't score well on environmental performance are doing quite well on that uh, scale. Okay. Can we have the second question as well? We'll take it could, could, I do, could I just finish? Oh, yeah, please. Um, and so if the, if the objective is to restore public trust, I think one of the things to do would be to find out what, um, what, pub, what, what would be measures of public trust, what, what kind of measures would inspire public trust. So it's not about whether a company has a policy, it's about whether a company actually delivers on that policy. That's, that's much more likely to inspire public trust. And I also seem to hear that uh, uh, the words fiduciary duty used again, which seem to imply that, again, we're just thinking back again to how much money is being made rather than uh, that is not uh, what full range of... Sorry, that's not what fiduciary <laughs> duty means. We'll come back to fiduciary duty. But, this is, but this is important. Fiduciary duty, it comes from loyalty. It's about loyalty to the actual investor. And I repeat, what people forget, that the investors have a duty <coughs> of loyalty to the average citizens who live in a corporation. That is why I said in the previous session, thinking about environmental issues is part of that duty of loyalty because it affects them. Thinking about society affects them. But I'll leave the experts Very good. to answer the specifics. Can we have the next one? Yeah, please. <coughs> Mark Goyer, Thomas Company. I want to go back up the... Um, up the road to, the, to John Kay's uh, philosophers. I thought we were saying that purpose is something we want to be unique to each company. We don't want companies all to have the same purpose. If we accept that premise, how can we then say that we're going to compare companies in measuring them against their different purposes? I, I, I've always taken the view that uh, you know, the best metaphor is Velcro. The thing about Velcro is it's two different surfaces, two surfaces of success. There's the qualitative and there's the quantitative. And, and looking at it from an investor eyes, I've always understood that uh, what investors are looking for in the end on the qualitative side is some, some total thing which is called quality of management. Now, I don't think, uh, my challenge to you is I don't think you can reduce that to a set of metrics like this and what's more, We've looked at many industries, and I just mentioned the NSS, where the attempt to go too quickly to measurement is actually at the expense of purpose, because while what gets managed gets <coughs> what get, while what gets measured gets managed, it also gets manipulated. Very good. So let's just pause. So, first question that it's self-fulfilling, Andy, 
and, and the second that we should really be bothered measuring this? Um, well, I'm going to start there, I think. So in terms of the self-fulfilling part, I mean, all I can really say is, I guess I'm not quite sure how that would work, but to, to reiterate the process that we went through here and taking on board all of the points that this is getting to the heart of what is the DNA of a company, getting to the heart of what is a company underlying trying to achieve, how does a culture work, is, is, is never going to come down to a set of numbers. I think we, we can all accept that. But in terms of the process we went through, we took the principles that we started from and then worked out what are the things that we can actually objectively measure to, that reflect those principles. So we were starting ultimately with trying to solve the goal of how do we find some way of assessing how companies are progressing towards the implementation of, print, of policies, processes, procedures and systems that allow them to implement these principles and how effectively are they doing so as a second stage. Um, if it's self-fulfilling in the sense that companies that are more effective or have put in place processes and are more effective in implementing them score better, I, I would say that's probably kind of the goal, really. Okay. Um, How about the second part? Would like to answer that in terms of is this worth doing in the first place? This, this, this doesn't capture the uniqueness. Yeah, I, I, the, I mean, I think uh, in terms of why, why measure, I think, A, you establish a benchmark. I think you... Um, uh, as, as somebody said, you know, if you measure something, it tends to get managed or it gets done. I think, for me, the most important thing is, I think Mike Rake talked about peer pressure, is that by raising awareness, you're going to the heart of what companies really care about, which is their reputations. And if they see an opportunity to improve their reputation by establishing a purpose that differentiates them from their competition uh, and gives them a sort of healthy glow of social respectability, I think they'll jump on it. So I think if you don't, if you don't provide a, a starting point and a measure, then it's all very loosey-goosey and no one's really going to do anything about it. John, what are you Can I link to? that point with, which, uh, with Mark's point? Because I, I, I rather agree with both of them. I think this exercise here is measuring something interesting and the fact that it generates superficially counterintuitive results, as by the list of companies that came up at the top, indicates that it's raising questions and making useful observations. I rather th agree with Mark's point that it, it's by the nature of properly defined business purpose that different businesses will have different business purposes. And more than that, there are such things as wicked purposes or purposes that are more desirable than other purposes. I won't go through them. I can't think of any business that... <laughs> the Mafia's purposes, that they're not appropriate purposes for our purposes. More difficult, actually, is the arms company uh, or the, the tobacco company that has a legitimate purpose, but not one we feel very proud of. Very good. Let me take a couple, two more questions yeah. in the back. Do you mind standing up? Andrew White, uh, Side Business School at Oxford University. Um, I think it's fascinating research what you've done, um, and in some ways it kind of captures the edge of where our current understanding is. My question is this, if we were to take the banking industry in 2007 and run them through that process, and then address the underperformance against the criteria, would it have stopped the crisis? My second question is this, that I think it was just a few weeks ago when the uh, General Medical said that obesity and diabetes in this country is at such a rate um, that it will effectively bankrupt the NHS. Um, now, I think we all have responsibility as individuals for that, but the food and drink companies have played a huge part. And so my second question is this, if you ran the food and drink companies that are, have some responsibility in that space through this process, will it arrest the problem we have in this country of obesity and diabetes? And it leads to uh, John's point. Very good. We'll take one more. <coughs> Gentlemen here, oh, who's got the mic? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, uh, Claire Fox, uh, Institute of Ideas. Actually, I, I was reacting initially to the re response that somebody gave as to why this would work. Um, when you said, what companies really care about is their reputation and comparing with their peers whether they have the advantage which seemed to me to completely destroy the whole point of this conversation, really, because I thought it was meant to be a felt, meant thing, not a kind of, 
well, you know, we don't want to be embarrassed in front of our peers and, um, and so on and so forth. Because that then does just instrumentalise it, turn it into a box-ticking exercise, and I thought was not the very purpose that we were talking about. But also, I, I thought that John came... I was so refreshed to hear him make the point about transparency earlier. Because I do think there's a kind of competitive show-your-colours moment on transparency to this kind of public that are a stage army that don't exist, really. Uh, usually they're NGOs pretending they represent the public. And then everybody keeps showing them everything. And now we're going to show them the metrics. And if we know nothing from education, we might notice that lead tables don't necessarily mean that you get the truth at all. And um, so that's one thing. Then the, the, just quickly on the, the, because it just got mentioned by the person before me and also because me, people have mentioned, John just mentioned arms company. One of the things that I get nervous about at gatherings like this is when we actually make moral judgments about the activities of certain companies that we personally disapprove of. Um, John Mansoni has been drummed out, it seems to me, of being a, 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 a um, uh, who's the new CEO of the civil service, has been drummed out of being um, um, on the board of an alcohol company because everybody assumes that they're evil and that he's bound to be doing no good at some point. Um, we all know that kind of food and drink companies are blamed for obesity and all things immoral and evil. But actually, they are legitimate companies, even tobacco. Thank you. I even think, tobacco. I think, I think we've got the question. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, would this have predicted the banking crisis in some way, if you're right? I, I think, I, I mean, I'll defer to, to James with this, but I think there are indications in it that would have raised the alarm bells. Um, the, in, in a different forum, there's a group of people called the 300 Club. said, what is the purpose of investment banking? And by the way, does it fit within this purpose if its ROE is very high? And I think that conversation might not have headed off the, 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 the crisis, but certainly would have had the conversation about the risk being taken. Um, Uh, principles uh, that will sustain their long-term financial performance. So we know that in, in a sort of secular world we live in, uh, individuals are losing trust with governments, with companies, with religions, what have you. And I think uh, in order to motivate people these days, they want to believe in something. And very often the most important thing is the place they work. And so they get enormous, companies get enormous value by engaging their employees. So I think it's multifaceted. What the motive is, um, you can be cynical or you can be um, you can be utopian. I think there's a pragmatic. But I do think I do have sympathy. I think motives are important. So let me give you some statistics between the in the FT recently, 
an average UK FTSE CEO now uh, earns 120 mm. times no. the average full-time employer in the UK, compared to 47 times in the, in the, in the year 2000. So it's 120 compared to 47. A median FTSE 100 director earns 2.4 million. Most of it is stock-based incentives. An average, a median FTSE 100 CEO earns 3.34 million. So you're earning 3.3 million. Your directors are earning 2.4 million. You think, you know, you can, you can probably realize, you know, do you think, so when you talk about purpose, do you think people who earn these sums of money, do you think they worry about purpose? John, what do you think? <clears throat> Can I go back to this rather boring focus on the meaning of words, please? Um, I think, first of all, if one takes instrumentality, instrumentality is, in some sense, fundamentally deceptive. Instrumentality is when I buy you a drink, not because I'm your friend, but because I hope you will buy life insurance. Me. Instrumentality is telling employees we care about you and who make that statement, not because you do, but because they believe you will work harder if you make that statement. Uh, on the other hand, worrying about what our peers will think of us is very much the, the process by which we acquire our moral sense. It's not in any it's not well, disreputable in that, in that kind of negative sense. I'd also go on, and this is to answer your question, Ben, uh, to link that to the, what we, would we have thought about banks before 2007? Well, I emphasize the difference in the number of words there. The function of banks is to operate the payment system and transform deposits into capital and help individuals manage their... Their, their personal finances. The purpose of banks, certainly as I would see it, is to meet customers' needs in that kind of way, to give their employees a satisfying life, to repay creditors, uh, and to make decent returns from shareholders. The objective of banks before 2007 was to make as much money as possible for their senior employees, and it was the the incompatibility of all of these that gave rise to these problems. But do you think highly paid executives, do they worry about purpose? I, I mean, um, there are two questions here. And one is, can a rich man be moral? And the answer is yes. That is true. Uh, and and uh, I, I shudder to try to get something out of Christian history with with the cardinal sitting there, but I'm, I'm sure I can think of one, but I'm not going to say it publicly. But yes, you can. A rich man can, can although it's difficult, uh, it can be true. The, the real question you're addressing is, um, can we expect people who operate such a degree of income inequality have purpose? Uh, and then you enter into uh, an area which either you're going to discuss it from a political perspective, and my views are reasonably well known, or you enter it from a moral perspective. And both of them actually would argue that this disparity of income perhaps has gone too far. Uh, and so part of purpose is to shrink that, that disparity further. So we'll take some questions now. Um, one here and then the gentleman here has been waiting for, for a while. Yeah. Richard Given, following on from Do that. Do you mind standing up, sir? Sorry. Richard Given, following on from that, I wonder if the question of incentives needs to be addressed and the fact that, as Charles Munger points out, they distort most mm. people's actions uh, beyond belief, oftentimes, mm. Mm. and how an organisation where stock options is such a driven drive such behaviour can have a purpose that's realistic. Yeah. Very good. Obviously loud. Please loud. Thank you. Hans Pong from Rand. Um, I'm wondering what the next steps are with the, your your interesting methodology, because I think clearly this is a first step. I think you framed it as such. A number of questions highlighted that. Um, and really, what's next? How are you looking to develop this? And to what extent will you expose it to wider external scrutiny, be it investment, academia, companies Very themselves? Good. You can answer that. Let's take one more. Yeah, we don't look clock. There's a sea of hands. It's always a challenge. <clears throat> um, I'm Gordon Silver from a company called Good Business Alliance. Um, 
this discussion is taking place uh, uh, within an environment where we are losing the glue that holds society together. Uh, we no longer have religion that combines and brings communities together. We no longer have uh, a sense of um, uh, understanding how we manage money, uh, be it Keynesian, be it monetarist. Uh, so we are struggling and swimming around to find meaning, and it's not just um, the poor CEO in his castle, but also the poor man at his uh, gate. So um, there is a question here, and the question is uh, what came out of, I think, your point about the inequality of the weight structure. Um, can inequality that continues to be unabated really be, sit comfortably within a capitalist system that continues to ignore it? And rather than talking about altruism and philanthropy and corporate philanthropy, is it now more a point where uh, social purpose is the reason that is potentially going to drive um, economic gain. Very good, thank you. So clearly incentives, and I mean, just to throw a few more statistics, as FTSE director CEO has soared, whatever it is, 21% last year, the TUC estimates an 8% drop in real earnings from the average mm -hmm. work in the, in the UK, and then also the whole phenomenon of share buybacks. If you're not familiar, share buybacks, company buys its own stock, that's been going at a phenomenal rate, 500 billion in the US. <laughs> and what share back, buybacks do is clearly is drive, is drive the, the stock price, and clearly that benefits a, a, a few people at the top. So clearly incentives and purpose, James? So I, I think incentives are absolutely the key um, to making businesses perform, but I, there has to be a balance. And um, I think, uh, you know, addressing the issue of income inequality and the disparity between the chief executive and the average employee is, you know, one that's going to challenge the capitalist system for years to come. And I think it's a, we're not just seeing it in business, we're seeing it in every walk of life. Um, I don't know whether it's the sort of law of comparative advantage or, or whatever, but clearly there are companies which are globalizing and where investors seem to be more interested in the size of the cake than the distribution of the cake. And in order to maximize the size of the cake, they find it very easy to allow or rather to cast a, a blind eye to what are clearly, in many cases, absurd levels of pay. So I think, for me, it comes back to uh, trying to inculcate the right cultures in businesses to find business people who want to do the job for the joy of doing the job rather than for the egregious salaries. I think investors have to squash um, uh, the most uh, um, egregious examples of executive pay. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll sure. pause there. But clearly there is a, there is a yeah. little bit of a yeah. journey here. So, yeah. But John, I'd like to close maybe not the incentive point, but related to that was the great report you did for Vince Cable, uh, was it last year or the, the, year, the year before, <laughs> where another barrier or potential barrier to purpose is all the short-termism that you identified in the, in the whole investment value chain. Any views on that? Do you think that short-termism is a barrier to purpose as we, as we kind of describe it here? I mean, that's very largely the issue, and this is goals versus purpose again. Right, if you have organizations which are goals that are unrelated to their business purposes, which is the short-termism problem, then you will get the kind of failure to meet the long-term requirements of the purpose. Uh, that we're describing. Let's open it up, yeah. The gentleman over there at the end, a little further down the Ashley, yeah. And, one. and there's one right in the front as well. Yeah. Yes, sir. <clears throat> I'm Peter Frankenthal of Amnesty International UK. Um, it's very reassuring that we're all focusing on the issue of purpose, and congratulations to, to Blueprint on taking us here. It could be argued that from a human rights perspective, the collective purpose of humanity is reflected in international instruments such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, international covenants on civil and political rights, economic social rights, ILO conventions, and so on. 
and over the last decade or so within the UN system, there has been uh, an initiative to transform these international instruments applicable to states to a set of standards applicable to companies. I'm sure you'll be familiar with the RUGI principles, the, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights yeah. endorsed by the Human Rights Council. My question is, wouldn't it be better to focus on standards that have been articulated and developed over a period of time within international bodies that are relevant to companies as a bridge between purpose and actual impact? Very good. The microphone is where? Go ahead, yeah. Please. Um, I, I just wanted to go back to incentives. Sorry, Debbie Ramsey from Good Corporation. Um, but I wanted to go back to incentives which we almost automatically think are financial. And how do, does the panel feel incentives might be made um, more... Uh, balanced in terms of looking at um, how you incentivize the right behaviors alongside your um, need to bring in your targets. Okay, we'll take one more. There's one right at the front. Uh, James Cora from the Church Investors Group. Uh, I want to ask an obvious question and maybe even an unhelpful question and ask whether you kind of turn this introspectively to start looking at the purpose of the investment management industry mm. and whether you um, had thoughts on what you, how you design an investment management company that would serve the common good. Yes. Absolutely. Very good. So we'll take the three questions. One on standards, Absolutely. like global standards, like as of am Amnesty International. Other incentive measures, other measures or other incentives rather to encourage good behavior and probably quite important, the, the role of the, the asset managers in all of this. Yes. So um, I'm not going to talk about the role of asset managers because that'll end up being just an advertisement for Hermes. Um, and, and it's not a joke. Well, Hermes is different, right? But Hermes is different. And here is the difference. Hermes is actually owned by pensioners. I mean, that's what makes a difference. Asset managers are an instrument. Right? What they do depends on what those who give them the mandates ask them to do. And that's why I think we should concentrate on the pension funds that own the assets Push it forward. That's the first element. I want to say very quickly about incentive. There are two questions in incentive, and I ask the audience to think about them separately. The first one is methodology. Uh, every single psychological study shows that bonus <laughs> payments distorts the way that you make decisions. I don't understand why we still keep on making bonus payments, other than the second question rears its ugly head, which is quantum. People are not comfortable with quantum. And people are not comfortable with quantum because we have disparity in our society. The richest borough in England is the Royal Borough of Kensington, Chelsea. If you walk from the bottom of the Goulburn <coughs> Ward in it to the top of the Knightsbridge Ward in it, you gain 20 years in your lifespan. This is in England today. So we have to talk about disparity. <coughs> it just is there. I think this to do with social cohesion. And I completely agree. We do have standards that we have to, in fact, start looking at as part of investment. So, James, are you, are you paid on companies having good purpose or are you paid on the returns that you're getting? Uh, I'm paid uh, on a variety of um, uh, factors, but the predominant one is uh, a very simple one, which is do I beat the market? And the more I beat it up to a limit, the better I do, because oh. that's what my clients, who ultimately are pension funds and charities, want me to do to maximise the benefits of their financial assets. Um, in order to do that, I'm very, very interested in what makes a company really perform. And um, at BlackRock, we have a qu huge quant business, which is trying to uh, unpick the sort of secrets of statistics to see whether there are relationships between um, types of behavior and performance. And you know, from my point, as I said earlier, I, I find that I make the, me the best investment decisions if I take a medium to long-term view. As an outsider looking at a company, uh, trying to understand what moves the share price, I only actually understand, in statistical terms, about 2% of the knowable information. So I have to rely on rules of thumb, and some of those rules of thumb are influenced by the types of behavior, the standards of corporate governance, uh, the, the interests that they have in their relations with their employees, with their suppliers, with their consumers. So I just do it to, to, for that purpose. I think 
To get to the issue of incentives and income inequality, etc., I think you know, I'm very struck by the fact that we've known for, since the 60s that you have ethical consumerism, which before used to operate in the way of boycotting companies that did badly, who were seen to lose social legitimacy. <coughs> and now you see uh, ethical consumerism rewarding companies that do well by buying their goods and services. I think we're going to see more and more of that in the investment world. And um, uh, Saka's company, Hermes, my own company in producing things called uh, 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 socially uh, oriented ETFs or exchange traded funds are directly creating products that drive capital, i.e. share, price, share prices ultimately, it will be influenced by good and bad behaviours. And I think that is the, um, one, one of the mechanisms by which bad behaviour, however society determines it, whether it's putting too much sugar in, in sugary drinks or paying the chief executive too much, if companies lose legitimacy, they will lose the value in their share prices. So let's stop then. Um, al alas, the clock has failed to agree to stay on for us, <laughs> and we've run out of time. I hate to interrupt. No, one more, one more question. <laughs> <laughs> the last question is for John Kerry. John, the kind of the barriers here and the structure. One of the things you had in your report were behind all of this are the asset owners and large pension funds, who seem to be only interested in maximizing returns. Do you see that as a big barrier to kind of enabling companies? Can I just to link them? that to what James just said and then use that to pull out a broader point? James said his clients want him to beat the market, and that is true. However, that isn't what his clients really want in the end. His clients are underlying beneficiaries of pension mm. funds, and what they want is to make him, make him to make money that will secure for them good and secure pensions. Now, what we've actually done is set up a dysfunctional system in which James as asset manager and the pension fund trustees who are intermediating this process have a goal, a short-term goal, that is not consistent with a long-term, or not immediately consistent with a long-term purpose of the investment activity. And that is something we need to address, and that was a central question in the report which I wrote. And I think we have in all of this to have in our mind the problem that we're using this word purpose and a variety of similar purposes in a rather casual kind of way. And I think we need to think more about the way these things are netted and, nested, and nested into each other. You, many of you will know the famous story of the person who was observing a cathedral being built and he asked uh, one stonemason, what are you doing? And he said, I'm shaping this stone. And another one said, I am building a great cathedral. Mm -hmm. And another one said, I'm working for the glorification of God. And they were all, in a sense, right. But they were saying different things about the same activity. And we need to think about what we're talking about here in that particular way. Very good. So we've gone out of time. So I'd like to uh, thank the panel, and particularly for all their work in doing the project. There was a question about next steps, and we are hope to carry on this work next year, and maybe you'd like to join the team as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.